I'm going to convince you tonight, or at least I'm going to try, that if we really want to save the world's ocean, if we want to address overfishing, address the fisheries crisis, we need to keep eating fish. Perhaps we even need to eat more fish. Yes, you heard me right, more fish. Of course, we need to choose to eat the right kind of fish, caught by the right kind of fisher, fisherman, fisherwoman. Why? Because who fishes matters. It matters to the sustainability of our oceans, to our food systems. Now, my argument might be quite different from what you may think or what you, we hear in the mainstream media. Um, and believe me, I'm a conservationist at heart. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. But widely advocated tools such as marine protected areas, while very useful in very specific contexts, if set up in the right kind of environment, are not the best solution, the more scalable solution to address the crisis in our oceans. To unpack my proposition, to, um, to give you kind of a glimpse of, of my perspective, I'm going to take you a bit of, on a journey. I'm going to go back a few steps and go back to where I started to get you through um, how I've come at this conclusion. I'm Serge Ramakers. I grew up in urban Europe. And as a kid, I was very quickly intrigued, like many of you, by our oceans, by their vastness, by, by the fauna. I think I was 10 when I could recite all dolphin and whale species by their Latin name. Okay. I went to every aquarium in Europe. I learned to dive when I was 13, and by 15, I'd actually dive across the globe on trips with my parents. I was privileged. I am privileged. I was groomed to become a conservationist. Um, I studied bioengineering at university. I um, obviously went into marine biology, into fishery science. But in 2004, I came to South Africa to undertake a PhD and to do a stock assessment of abalone. Now, stock assessments in fishery science, stock assessments are done by using fisheries independent data and fisheries dependent data and putting all of that in a complex mathematical model. Yeah. So, I had to dive, count abalone, and uh, use particular research methods. Now, what my supervisor hadn't told me, that I was going to be doing this along the wild coast, <laughs> around the South African coast. So, we're diving conditions in the inshore area are, are pretty terrible. My penny never dropped. But it gave me quite a bit of time. It gave me quite a bit of time to connect with local traditional fishers, and I got interested in their story. How are they fighting for fishing rights? How are they trying to secure their customary practices, their tradition? What is their context of extreme poverty, of limited opportunities? Together with millions of fishers around the globe, these people, these small-scale fishers, contribute from some 60 to 80% of the global catch, depending on the statistics used. Okay? But I became very intrigued by how they understand, how they perceive ecosystems. How do they perceive ecosystems change? How do they understand climate change? In fact, maybe I could learn something from them. And that changed my whole trajectory. I've learned fishers catching species that I didn't even know we could eat. I've learned from fishers how they can tell by the color of the lobster from which area it comes from how they can read the oceans to predict red tides, how they have 11 different names for one fish, depending on its size, depending on the currents it swims in, depending on um, how it interacts with other species, and of course, how, it, um, how it's prepared in their traditional cuisine. That local ecological knowledge can become an extremely powerful um, opportunity for ocean stewardship, as these fishers are, of course, the ultimate observers. They have salt water running through their veins. Now, the realization that local ecological knowledge can be a catalyst for ocean stewardship, okay, for um, better fisheries management, it's an asset for fisheries management, that spurred me on, together with a whole team and, of course, these fishers to embark and um, embrace the power of mobile technology, to harness this knowledge. We never realized that providing fishers with a simple mobile logbook 
on their um, smartphones would become such a powerful tool. Fishers go out fishing, record various oceanic and atmospheric variables, their catch, of course, their expenses, their income, the occurrence of illegal fishing activities, um, the catch of unusual species, and then they take this data, they look at their dashboards, they look at these summary charts um, of their activities on their personal dashboards to make sense of their fishing operations, to perhaps plan for better fishing operations, or to understand the impact they have on their fishing operations. They can then share this data with fellow fishers, with stakeholders, to look at more ca aggregated catch, more aggregated data, or they can use the tool as an accounting tool to upgrade their activities. Or simply, they can showcase that they exist, that they are legitimate in their informal fishery. Now, a co-design approach and a co-ownership model has spurred on a movement. A movement of fishers claiming their fishing rights, claiming their human rights, but showcasing to us that they too have a voice in science and conservation. We're seeing a big data movement in small-scale fisheries. But it doesn't stop there. Why? Because that local ecological knowledge can be channeled through a digital value chain to your plate. A few years ago, I went to a well-known Cape Town restaurant and I ordered a mixed seafood platter. Well, I was served New Zealand mussels, um, whitefish caught by an industrial trawler, and squid from Patagonia. Needless to say, I wasn't very thrilled. About a year ago, I went to another restaurant and got the same mussels again from New Zealand, only to be told by the waiter um, that these mussels were caught by artisanal fishers of Cape Point. Nice try, but greenlit mussels only occur in New Zealand, and Cape Point is a reserve. <laughs> At the same time, our South African small-scale fishers can provide us with an amazing variety of seafood. They catch it with low-impact gear. Some of these species are underutilized. Did you know that seafood production has one of the lowest carbon footprints of all our food items? That's stuff to think about. So what we need to do is disrupt value chains, from boat to plate, from hook to cook. Okay? We need to go back to a different kind of food systems, to trying to eat catch of the day where we can, while at the same time, of course, offer a fair price for the fisher, who often is a price taker um, um, to the middlemen. For example, Yellowtail in Cape Town, here in some of the restaurants, fetches a price of up to 250, even 300 rand a kg, while a small-scale fisher will get up to 30 rand a kg. That's a massive margin. So what if, what if chefs, retailers, consumers like you and I could access what we call storied seafood, traceable seafood, um, on a digital platform, powered by community technology that at the same time provides us with the data we need to better manage our fisheries, to rebuild our fisheries. But all of that on a foundation of local ecological knowledge. Well, that's the journey we've embarked on. Okay. And that's how fishers in South Africa are empowering themselves in their communities. It's taken me from marine biologist to social scientist to the social entrepreneurship space. I've had to learn concepts like fintech and lean startup and agile development and unit econometrics, all because I want to try and drive the sustainability and the scalability of the program, but also at the same time nurture this movement of fishers claiming their space loud and clear in the future of our oceans, in, um, in their livelihood, in their tradition. Let's face it, people, well, the majority of the world's population is poor, and so are many small-scale fishers. They can't stop fishing. They won't stop fishing. They shouldn't. In fact, it's been estimated that in, if Africa's fisheries were well managed, they would contribute more to food security than agricultural production. That's big. At the same time, these fishers can offer us an amazing food system. 
Mm -hmm. And through technology, it offers an opportunity for us to drive our conservation efforts with fishers rather than against or without them. So by purchasing storied seafood, seafood with a story, buying the right fish caught by the right fisher, we not only contribute to the fisher's economy, but we also um, contribute to the generation of that data that we so desperately need for fisheries management. So what we eat has the power to change the world for the worse or for the better. Yeah. Nowhere in the world is storied seafood as important as in South Africa, given our marine diversity, but also against the backdrop of, of, of our political history and of our prevailing social injustices. So next time you go and buy seafood, find out if it's sustainable, where, when, how it was caught, but also ask yourself who caught it, because who caught it truly matters. That's the idea I have to share. Thank you very much.